creative community. I'm your host David Starkey and my guest this time is poet Pamela Davis. Pam, welcome. Hi David. Um, man, I've been trying to get you on this show and you are here so I'm, I'm <laughs> psyched. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy as well. Uh, you know, you are the author of a book, Lunette, um, an award-winning book that you're going to read a, a few poems from, but I sort of talked you into reading some newer work so yes. um, people who haven't um, seen your work at all, we'll, we'll get your newest work and, and your mini fans in, in Santa Barbara and, <laughs> and in Ventura and environs will get a chance to sort of hear what you're up to. Um, so tell me a little bit about Lunette, this, this book that, that won this award. Um, Lunette uh, was the product of several years in the making really while well I learned the craft of poetry. Mm. And um, I had been a independent writer as a career, so I'd always written. And what were you writing? I was writing, oh, I ghost wrote books. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of medical writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so just prose, instructional prose? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. I, I wasn't a tech writer, okay. but um, journalism mm -hmm. as well. So I was fortunate to make my living by my pen because if I had to sell shoes, I don't think I would have <laughs> starved, actually, because I can't sell but I can write, and right. I always knew that was my favorite activity. And um, in sixth grade, I had a teacher, Miss Ritchie, who singled me out and put me in a class for students that were good writers, mm -hmm. and she saw some promise in them. And that was, that was all it took. And is, that, is that case you hear over and over with yeah. writers? Is it one yeah. person said, you're good at this, and right. that's all you needed to hear? Right, and I, I kind of feel like Miss Ritchie rides on my shoulder <laughs> saying, that a girl, you know, <laughs> keep going. Right. And so um, when I was fortunate enough to step back from um, working full-time independently but taking all every job, um, I started to write poetry again. Mm -hmm. And then I just couldn't stop writing it all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, now I'm a full-time poet. That's what you do. Yeah, that's yeah. what I do. Yeah. Well, let's <laughs> hear this book that was the result of your apprenticeship. And I don't think readers are not going it? to um, believe it was an apprenticeship because the <laughs> poems are really accomplished. Well, thank you very much. Um, this cover was done by um, a local group. Um, I don't have their name. Um, I really should say, I should give them the credit, um, but they created this cover, mm -hmm. which Lunette, I should say, um, means in French um, a single eyepiece, like a spectacle, mm. but a single lens. But in the Old English Dictionary, the first, um, I believe that the first definition is a crescent uh, lens. and. I think it's down around the fourth. It's the uh, it's the holder that the the person who's going to be guillotined, where they lay the head <laughs> before the right. chop. So I have a poem in here called "Guillotine: A Love Poem." So I thought, well, that's kind of an appropriate <laughs> title. I think I like that. Um, but this poem is a poem about my mother. My mother went blind, and um, she was she was kind of a Glamour Puss, um, and I had watched her as a girl very, very often at the mirror, mm. um, and was kind of fascinated with that whole ritual before the mirror. But she could no longer, after she went blind, she could no longer apply makeup, mm. and so this is about a situation dealing with that makeup. Mother tilts up her chin. Blind eyes closed, as if receiving a benediction. I stroke foundation across her brow, down the nose, 
blend liquid beige into crevices bracketing her mouth. The last time I touched her face, my hands were small, shy tourists to glamour. The vanity drawer exhales clouds of powder that rise, sift back to the bottom. Lacquered strands of dark dyed hair stick to its wood. Her arsenal of pots and wands are used up, colors outmoded. I dig a nail into a dried out crater of rouge, pat dabs of pink on her cheeks. Mother's skin sinks under my touch. Here's her lipstick, cherries in the snow, worn flat to the rim. I swab enough to redden her mouth. She rolls her lips, evening out the color. Holding a mirror to her face, I say, we're done. She turns her head this way and that, seeing herself beautiful. Mm. Is that based on something that actually occurred? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you are going to these elaborate lengths for something that she will not be able to witness visually, but she can somehow picture from all the right. years that she's done it before. Yes. I think I created the experience for her. Uh -huh. Of what it's like to, to be made up. Yeah, and yeah. to feel beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, great and really you. poignant, too. And you have another poem, I think, from the book that is a little less <laughs> <laughs> solemn. This is not my, haz my husband's favorite poem. Okay. He's a good guy, though, so we have He's to say He's a great yeah, guy. Yeah. My gosh, he's married to me. <laughs> he's withstood all my poems all these years, being the subject sometimes. This is titled, The Other Side of the Bed. Listen, you can grow to hate a man sleeping on his back. Boat bottom throat sucking light, dark, even the webs from the room. You stare up at cornered spiders holding on with sticky pluck. You can grow to hate the way his head dents the pillow like his mama's lap, mouth open, greedy baby. Sleep gorged, he grips the sheet as if it's his binky, <laughs> grumps every time you tug your scrap of it back, watching his gullet bubble and flutter, a flounder but louder. You might consider fitting your pillow over that face. You could grow used to sleeping alone, dainty you, quiet under your ruffled cover. You'll get a cat, a silk quilt, a pink kimono. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've heard you read that poem several times, and it always reminds me of waking up with my wife's hand over <laughs> yeah, my mouth. I'm and telling I'm, you. I'm dreaming that I'm dying, and it turns out that it, <laughs> I'm about to die if I don't stop story. I know, yeah. that, that notion occurs, you know, in the middle of the night when yeah. you haven't slept for several hours, yeah. but yeah. someone else has. Yeah, absolutely. The one right that. next to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, I mean, two poems, though, about um, husband and mother, uh, poems yeah. about family, is that a, 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 a theme that you feel compelled to follow? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've got quite a, quite a colorful family. Mm -hmm. I think. What, what are, for instance? Well, I, I think, David, you know that my father was a mortician. Mm -hmm. And um, so I grew up in that business. Right. I played there after school. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had, a, my grandmother lived with us and she was a working woman. I had two choices. Mm -hmm. My mother, who always seemed um, just completely overwrought at the end of the day by mm -hmm. having four kids, you know, mm -hmm. wanting things and all day long. And my grandmother, who sailed out the door mm -hmm. in the morning, all dressed up with her costume jewelry. Mm -hmm. She worked in the mortuary, too. Mm -hmm. And then came back in looking the same way. And right. at the end of the day, my mother was a wreck. Right. And I thought, door number mm -hmm. one, door number two, <laughs> I think I'll go to work. Right. And so but you did. Yeah, I did. She was a formidable woman, my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes. Yeah, so my family's very close, um, and they're good fodder. Yeah. <laughs> and are they good sports? <laughs> they're good sports. Yeah. I I have three brothers. I had two or, or one still living. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, let's let's let's. I promised viewers that we were going to hear some of your newer work. So let's All let's right. zoom right in there, and I'll let you select what you think is is most uh, appropriate for right now. All right. Um, I'm fun, I'm fortunate in that I have friends, uh, two French friends, who have an extra apartment in Paris, mm. and well we can stay there anytime we want. And so I leave a computer there, a big winter coat. And oh, I was a nanny also for a year okay. in Paris, so I fell in love with Paris. So I have the opportunity to travel there occasionally and um, observe French life mm -hmm. with the same amount of interest right. I observe life at home. And so this is, this is a poem that took place in France. It's titled, it's an in jam title, so the title will run into the first line. Okay. The nun buying men's cologne has the face of the old crone who poisons Snow White. Only God would give such an unfortunate face a job. Wearing contemporary habit and thick hose, she slung a toad brown purse sideways across her body. It sags like a dead puppy on her bosom. What is she doing with her nose in a bottle of Chanel Allure Poor men. Her years of fierce prayer, deprivation, magnify under the counter's unrepentant lights. Dark, wayward moles constellate her cheek. Who on earth is she buying for? A sales girl in a lab coat offers unsolicited samples of women's perfume, cocoa and number five, cristal. The nun extends an inch of her wrist for a splash. Citrus, honeysuckle, hyacinth, a summer night. She was young. He was a soldier on one knee. She waited, O oh Lord, how she prayed. I name her Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrow. Add another to my list of neglected women. The sales girl directs more spray toward the nun's cropped hair. Blossoms float over to where I stand watching a small smile soften her mouth. She tucks her head. Maybe a singular happy memory is enough for a lifetime. Mm. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you find yourself doing that often, just looking at people and creating the story that goes with it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, was su it was such an incongru incongruous yeah, right. uh, situation to see a nun in a perfume shop. Right, yeah. Well, I'm also, you know, I uh, love your language, Pamela, and, and the the bag like a dead puppy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a daring, uh, you know, simile, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but how did that come to your head? Um, well, it was a pretty big, hideous bag, uh, and, you know, and it looked... It did look like... And, and it looked like she was... Uh, carrying yeah, a dead puppy. Carrying around. a dead puppy. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, she had, she had thick shoes and thick hose and, mm -hmm. um, you know, everything was so plain about her. And then to see a smile right. on her face and see a little girl behind that smile, not a little girl, but a young girl in love, perhaps, mm -hmm. according to my imagination, right, right. Um, was just wonderful. And always uh, curious about a poet's composition process too. So you witnessed this event, mm -hmm. and were you taking notes as you saw it, or did you just go home and? Uh, I I didn't take them in the shop. Um, I took them when I when I stepped out onto the street. I always take contemporaneous right on, okay, notes yeah, uh -huh. um, when something makes a strong impression right. on me like that. So um, yeah. And then back up to the apartment. Yep. And how long does something like that take you to write? How many oh, she, drafts? She it? was fast, uh -huh. uh, maybe three drafts. Okay. Yeah. So you're just writing, changing a little bit, and, and mm -hmm. it's, it's done. And then yeah. always read it to, to hear what the uh -huh. uh, sonics yeah. are of the poem. That's yeah. important to me. And you can hear when something's out of tune. Off, yeah. 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 No, Great poem. Quite let's, jarring. let's keep keep on going. Okay, what's, well. What's another, another new poem from um, Pamela Davis? <laughs> yes. So this um, also originated in France because I was at, um, there's the L'Orangerie Museum, which has Monet's Water Lilies, mm -hmm. a pretty spectacular two rooms 
um, very large, like a whole walls of them. And um, it has a French title, Trompe l'oeil, which is, means a trick of the eye. Trompe l'oeil, I see you, little slip, a gelatinous flash, unselfed fetus cast among lilies. Monet painted this pond for three years. No matter the hour or weather, dabbed the tip of his brush to mirror the water's reflections, blossoms, sunlit silt, slivers of gloss. Chill memory tugs my side, a clandestine clamp, scrape of silver spur, paper bag sagging with sick, changeling, splinter, I've spied you before in Turner's bronze washes, Sorat's miniature prisms. Here in the Impressionist's world, your double multiplies in the immaterial colors of water, clouds, sky. Aqueous light rises as breath does, preparing to fall. I spy fingers, I spy toes. For years I've avoided your other doubles, goldfish rounding carnival bowls, primordial shapes in lab jars, huge heads bowed as prayer. If I'd harbored you when the unformed limb bumped against my rampart, what then of your shimmer? What then of mine? The father, your father, I only remember broad freckled hands, straw-scented skin, the red bike he rode across the country, propped at my door, the red bike gone, forgotten the coupling, the primal song. You understand I had my reasons. I study the pond's nursery dapple of creamy yellows, willows, skitter wings. Your tiny palms, I would have kissed them. Wow, so maybe that's one of the things that we poets use poetry for is to yeah. Dive deep into something that is really distressing. Yes, um, and you're doing that um, via art. Mm -hmm. um, so, Trump Loy is, uh, I think of it as, as something that I think, oh, that's real. Now it's fake. You right. Know? Uh, um, right. Talk about the the title and how that um, weaves in with the art and the. the um, um, my French friend Dominique told me, "Have you seen the water lilies in a while?" And I said, mm -hmm. "No." And he said. Next time you go, stand in one place, mm -hmm. and because there are many canvases, right. um, stand in one place and let the painting come to you. And that's what I did. And that painting come, came to me with this little, with this little daub of, of shimmering light. Mm -hmm. And that took me on this journey to the past. And um, then uh, I was able to kind of come to terms with an old event that um, I've never really dealt with in this way. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do it without judgment or right. um, political statement. Right. Um, and it was an interesting exercise. It's the only time I've written about it. Does that feel like a spiritual moment? I don't know if you're a spiritual person, if, you're, if that's part of your, your life. Mm -hmm. uh, that, it sounds like a, a moment of epiphany. Yes, it felt that way. Uh -huh. It felt that way. Um, it felt like I was able to finally speak about to, it. To, yeah, because to, yeah, you were, cause you were yeah. addressing the, mm -hmm. the lost child. Yes. Yeah, that's really powerful. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've got about eight minutes left here. And wow. I, um, I've got about a hundred more pops. <laughs> Let's go. We're, we're not going to be able <laughs> to get to all of them. So with that in mind, you probably have time for two, maybe three. Um, oh, two or three. What would you, David. What would you jump into um, for us, Pamela? I have a poem. Um, I'm very concerned about the fact that um, certain words from nature mm -hmm. are um, becoming obsolete. And the Ch Oxford Children's Dictionary has dropped, do you know about this? Mm -hmm. They've dropped words like um, fern, um, <laughs> kingfisher, uh -huh. lilac, wow. heather. And why? Because they had to make room for gigabyte. Oh. And right. the Tech words. Yeah, that's a poem that practically writes itself. Yeah, there, isn't it? <laughs> right. And so I decided to, um, and, and and I think when we don't have a word for something, it ceases to exist. Right. It's a way of obliterating, canceling, Cancel canceling culture. it yeah. out. You know, even as as maybe the our climate is canceling right. it out. Right. And um, so I thought um, that one way of bringing the language back into use is to write it. Mm -hmm. And while uh, this subject of this poem is not endangered, there's, there is not endangered. There is a word that's been dropped, which is fern, in this poem. Okay. So I, I took a really simple approach. I wanted to, uh, um, you know, I've heard, I've heard it said that when we think of nature as something outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. we're, we're really being um, solipsistic. We are nature. Right. We are of it, and so um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to sound um, sc um, scholarly. I wanted to be face to face with nature, so I went out and looked at moss. Okay. Closely, <laughs> <laughs> talking to moss. How do you survive on a rock? Do you always congregate where water runs? Do you mind sharing the sluice? Are the ferns foes or friends of yours? What is your food? Do you enjoy spells of sun in the afternoon? Everywhere moss, a metropolis on damp rock. Are these your children running away with green? Why does your home weep? Does the rain burn? Why do you build on top of your own chalky skeletons? Are they your forebears? Half your family is dead then. What will happen if your rock runs out of rain? Will you die on the backs of your ancestors? I'm sorry my touch turns them to dust. Hmm. So, you just wrote a poem addressed to moss. <laughs> I went out. I went out and, and looked at moss. Yeah. And you're asking all these questions in your mind. Is there? It some, seems like some of them might have a scientific answer, and others might not have any answer at all. And right? and for many, the answer is unknown to us as yet. Yeah. You know. Right. Um, but I, you know, I touched it, mm -hmm. and and. Um, I, I feel that we're really lucky to live in Santa Barbara right. because nature is, we can live close, close up to yeah. it and enjoy it. Um, but I think this, the only true thing I know is nature. This mm -hmm. is what I've found mm -hmm. particularly lately. Mm -hmm. And that's where I go when I need, when I need to, to be at peace. Right. And so you're doing that here by just looking so closely at something mm -hmm. that's among the simplest living organisms, yeah. you know, and, and you're asking it these very complex <laughs> questions. <Yeah. laughs> it's a nice <laughs> irony. We just have, I think, four minutes left. So it's probably just okay. time for one more poem. Is there? Because um, um, I want I want you to give a little bit of advice to aspiring poets okay. before we we close up the show. Um, okay. You've heard this poem, perhaps. Okay. This is, I have a lot of stories to tell, so this is one of them. It's titled Hot Sheet Motel with an epigram by Emily Dickinson. I never heard the word escape without a quicker blood. With a bank loan and the last of my dead father's trust, I bought the crust motel, 40 flat blocks from the beach in a navy town. 
decommissioned destroyers, sailors with no port, a strip mall in stucco and brick, easy to miss. I moved into a room behind front desk, smoked Virginia Slims until the bars closed at two. The vacancy sign stayed lit all night, neon beaming two crossed palms the color of tequila into the fog. I went to bed in my clothes, pulled Moon, my brother's husky, next to me, sat up reading poetry on a pull-down bed. Men left women waiting in shadowy fords to come inside. At the ding of the bell, I stepped out front. Mr. Miller, Mr. Smith, or just Mr. paid cash for a key. Listening for the mechanical teeth of the ice machine to finish its dump, I rewound Joni Mitchell back to blue. When a customer drove off, I pulled on rubber gloves, turned the room in 10 minutes flat, swabbed toilets, ashtrays, tossing some woman's pantyhose, someone's drink into a black trash bin I towed like a barge behind me. 24 years old, a virgin in love with Dickinson and Plath. What was I thinking? Counting the night's take, it was never enough. Hot sheet motel. <laughs> <laughs> had, had a few jobs. Yeah, so that's... Not really uh, my English degree, but kind of hard to get a job, yeah, you know? Well, it paid off ultimately. <laughs> um, again, we just have about a minute or so left. Um, I'd love for you to give what you think is like the most important advice if you're beginning to write poetry or if you've been writing poetry for 50 years. What, what's, what have you come to find? Um, what I've come to find is, say you're, you've started a poem and you have it in your mind, I'm going to write a poem about this. And all of a sudden, this oddball mm. line comes in and it belongs nowhere near the poem. It was not in your head to write about that, but it comes so insistently I've learned to pay attention to it. And D.H. Lawrence talks about this, the three strange angels that, comes to the do that come to the door, and he says, admit them, admit them, because that could very possibly be your poem. Mm -hmm. And that's that deep voice that is making itself heard, and that's, that's golden. When that voice, kind of like the undervoice, when that voice breaks through, that's when I feel my best poems come from that voice. It's, it's barely intentional. It's mm -hmm. almost like channeling, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I've learned to trust that voice and not um, be too quick to edit. To it. Yeah. We're gonna end on that. Sure. Great words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Pamela. Thanks, David. The Creative Community is a co-production of TVSB and CAPS Media in Ventura. Here in Santa Barbara, it is produced with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation, directed by J.P. Montalvo and his fantastic crew. Thank you so much for watching. I'm David Starkey, and we'll see you next time.